Hanan. I teach at UNLV Boyd School of Law. I co-direct the new misdemeanor clinic with uh, my colleague, Ann Trom. And I'm Ann Trom at UNLV Boyd School of Law. And um, in addition to, before doing the, um, co-directing the misdemeanor clinic with Eve, I've also run an appellate clinic. Okay. Um, and I'm, I'm really thrilled to be presenting with all of you. Um, so today we are gonna offer our insights about the different ways that our clinics, which all focus on misdemeanor defense, teach justice. So I'll start off by talking about how I use the concept of justice and supervision and in classes that bookend the semester, um, intentionally using a justice seeking, um, a justice seeking goal as the frame for the entire semester. Uh, Professor Moran will follow with a discussion of how she uses court watching and courtroom observation to teach her students about justice in a climate where being disruptive, um, uh, uh, the opposite of what she calls uh, Minnesota nice, um, flouts sort of a deeply held social norm of prioritizing civility. And professors Henan and Traum will discuss justice in the context of finding a clear, like blazingly obvious X marks the spot instance of injustice in um, a traffic court case. Um, and they'll discuss the inertia sort of pushing against finding a way to vindicate that injustice and uh, just the kind of activation energy that it took to actually push through that inertia. So um, my clinic uh, represents misdemeanor and municipal clients in and around the Denver area. Um, and so basically the kinds of cases that we generally get are assault, disorderly conduct, disturbing the peace, uh, failure to obey a lawful command from a police officer or resisting, things like that. So um, as is true with uh, the criminal justice system everywhere, most of the cases, the vast majority of the cases resolve with pleas. Although um, I am proud to say that my clinic has a higher than average dismissal rate. Um, so uh, right at the beginning of the semester, um, I zero in on the concept of students as justice creators. And here, I, uh, I think because I am an African-American woman, I think this is what the students expect. So I don't have to, um, and I think students possibly self-select based on this. So I'm not that worried about um, um, creating an environment that's not inclusive to all viewpoints, um, though I do pay attention to that throughout the semester. Um, so I zero in on the concept of students as um, justice creators. Um, and um, we take two L's and three L's. Um, and so uh, particularly with the two L's, they've just finished their first year. Um, I'm sure we've all read the uh, studies about how most people come to law school to make a difference. Um, and so, right, so they don't know, like I find that my students don't know like music from the 60s but they do know to know famous cases like Gideon versus Wainwright or Brown v. Board, right? They wanna to come to law school and sort of be a hero. So um, in the very first class of the semester, pretty much in the context of setting expectations for the semester, and in particular in the context of setting expectations for what to expect in weekly supervisions, um, I discuss a George Eliot quotation. Um, and uh, the quotation is, uh, justice is like the kingdom of God. It is not without us as a fact. It is within us as a great yearning. Um, and the whole goal there is to get the students to start thinking about um, what justice looks like, right? Because now that they have this law degree, they have special access to creating justice. So then in supervisions throughout each, throughout the case and throughout the semester, um, I ask uh, some variation of the question knowing everything you know about this client, all the investigation you've done, all the discovery in this case, if there were justice in the world, what would happen in this case? How would it resolve? And this usually emerges in the context of discussing an offer that we've received from the prosecutor to resolve a case short of trial. Um, and so uh, just to give a, a catalog of the kinds of questions that come up in this discussion, right? Uh, what's your uh, idea of what justice looks like in this case? What, what about what the client would say justice is? How does your vision of justice jive with the client? Um, um, how important is your vision of justice in relation to the clients? What about the prosecutor's vision of justice? 
And how does that vision impact yours, if at all? Or what about the clients? Um, and if there's a gap between the vision of justice that's best for, for the client and the vision of justice that the prosecutor has, what steps can we take to close this gap, right? So that as opposed to talking about what's a good offer for a case like this in this jurisdiction, um, I pretty, um, I very consciously move the students from, uh, away from that kind of formula, uh, formulation. Um, and I find that misdemeanor cases are particularly helpful here because there's more room to consider alternate con uh, conceptions of justice. Like in felony cases, it might seem more likely that alternate conceptions of justice just means different ideas about, about how much prison time the uh, defendant should receive. But in misdemeanor cases, which range so much in seriousness from you know, disorderly conduct to, um, um, to between, you know, based on a charge, an argument between two neighbors, to destruction of property where somebody's camera's damaged in a bar fight. Um, students are more willing to imagine other things like maybe mediation between the neighbors or just have somebody pay money to fix the camera. Um, and so, so there's something about the lower stakes of the alleged defense and misdemeanor case, cases combined with the lasting effects of the collateral consequences of a conviction um, sort of create a great laboratory for students to be more creative. Um, we, uh, Raising this question in supervision also allows a uh, discussion of a uh, very specific discussion of different kinds of justice, um, right? Justice according to whom. So we um, raise and uh, we raise ideas about and um, create definitions for retributive justice, for rehabilitative justice, um, for restorative justice, and for social justice. Um, and what's great about this is you end up doing a lot of parallel universing. Right, so uh, thinking about the case, particularly from the prosecutor's point of view, um, and this is helpful in terms of um, uh, not demonizing opposing counsel, um, and also to get the students early on in the practice of figuring out, um, if, if, if they wanna be public defenders, of figuring out what emotionally they need to do to be in this line of work for a long time, because it can be very corrosive um, if you just sort of hate everybody all the time. So, um, uh, so there's that. And then, um, and then I also make sure to ask the same question at different points in the case. And here my learning goal is very specific. It's trying to underscore that justice isn't best understood as a static case outcome, right? It's an accumulation, it's a practice, it's phenomenological, right? It's consistently triggered by the way individual and cultural beliefs flow into the operation of the criminal justice system. So the question of whether prosecutors are trying to seek justice, specifically, I try to uh, teach the students, is a red herring, right? The criminal justice system is full of instances of dehumanization of defendants that are instrumental in ordering our society's impoverished notion of what justice looks like. And so that's the, the, the conversation that I'm sort of constantly nudging the students towards. Um, and then, in the um, penultimate, penultimate class of the semester, uh, we present a class on race in the criminal justice system. And here I'll just present the quote that I end the semester with uh, by, way, you know, by way of talking about how I bookend the semester with quotes about justice. So that class on uh, race in the criminal justice system is largely centered around um, uh, the thesis uh, made popular by Michelle Alexander in the New Jim Crow and um, what, how Brian Stevenson um, uh, paraphrases it that slavery didn't end, it just evolved, right? And it now exists in the, in the form of the criminal justice system. And so that entire class is, uh, the, the question that that entire class is trying to answer is whether the criminal justice system is basically slavery dressed in due process clothing. Um, and so I'll say two things from that class. First, the first is I'll, I start the class um, by saying that we're not debating whether or not the criminal justice system is racist. We're, we're talking about why, right? Um, and, I, and the students have read lots of statistics about how um, case outcomes are worse for people of color at every discretion point. Um, so that uh, I, I really use the statistics as a cudgel basically to move the class discussion in a different direction talking about, uh, to talk about racial justice. Um, and uh, you know, then we spend some time talking about, I'll paraphrase my favorite quote from uh, one of my favorite movies, The Greatest Trick Racism Ever Pulled 
was convincing the world it doesn't exist, right? And so uh, basically, given what the students read, have read, I say, so we are not falling for the trick right now, right? In this class, we see the system for what it actually does, and we're going to believe the decades of research. Um, and that's going to be the first part of the class, but the second part of the class is, also, is where we um, explode uh, that ideology, right? Ide ideologies in place are invisible. And right now what we're trying to do is make it visible. We're trying to articulate and name this, ideolo this ideology that uh, produces these outcomes, these unjust outcomes. Um, and so, uh, and I pull up a quote from uh, Vac Vaclav Havel, uh, which is uh, about hope. Um, and uh, it starts with, uh, hope is, I believe, a state of mind, not a state of the world. Either we have hope within us or we don't. So again, that it underscores the idea of, 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 of an internal calculation. Um, hope is not a prognostication, it's an orientation of the spirit. Um, and uh, uh, hope um, is definitely not the same thing as optimism. Uh, it's not the convention that something will turn out well, but the certainty that something makes sense regardless of how it turns out. And uh, particularly that last sentence, it's not the conviction that something will turn out well, but the certainty that something makes sense regardless of turns out, oh, oh, regardless of how it turns out. Um, I talked to the students about how that also sounds like a definition of justice. And what if we had a criminal justice system that was hope-based instead of process-based, right? What would that look like? Um, and uh, so, uh, and then we close the class with some, with, you know, entertaining that thought exercise. Um, so that's my offering. Um, and uh, now I will turn it over to Professor Moran. Thank you so much, uh, Robin. I'm excited to be here. As uh, Professor Walker Sterling mentioned, I'm going to talk about teaching resistance lawyering or rebellious lawyering in a relatively non-rebellious state. Um, so I moved to Minnesota in June. Um, and there is a pervasive aspect of Minnesota culture uh, that I think is common to the Midwest, but is a little bit perhaps more, even more prevalent here, that the locals refer to as Minnesota nice. Um, from my outsider perspective, so far what I've gleaned about Minnesota nice is that it seems to be a euphemism for unwillingness to confront people or acknowledge when something is going wrong. Um, and the way this manifests itself in the criminal system is that people get extremely uncomfortable when you disrupt their ordinary mode of business by suggesting that anything about it could potentially be wrong or is wrong. Um, so that's uh, the context that we're working, I'm working in geographically. As far as the student body at St. Thomas, um, it's about 80% white it, students. It is predominantly, though not entirely, Midwestern students. Um, and truly a tremendous variety all over the ideological spectrum. So I have students uh, ranging from rage against the governmental machine to um, I just think prosecutors are here to pursue justice and uh, we're all kind of on the same side pursuing the same thing. So I'm gonna talk about one method I use to teach justice in this context, and that's uh, the idea of teaching curiosity and critique. So uh, let me start with why I think teaching curiosity and critique is an important foundation to teaching, helping students figure out what justice is and how to pursue it. So my observation is that students, uh, especially students who are having their first ever experience representing clients or appearing in court, have a tendency to accept what they see in court at face value. For many students, the initial question they're asking is, um, how they can fit into the system, not how they can disrupt it. And I don't think that I, as an educator, can get them excited about disrupting the system unless they decide for themselves that it needs to be disrupted. And there's a wide variety of viewpoints coming into the clinic as to whether does it need to be disrupted or is it something that's working well. So one of my goals throughout the semester, and especially at the beginning of the semester, is to get students to closely analyze the system that they are now becoming participants in, and to frequently provide opportunities to assess what is working, what's not working. Another way of saying that is what's just and what's unjust. So we spend the particular method that I use is that we spend the beginning of every single class debriefing the previous court appearances. Um, and we often spend time talking about 
the minutia of the court appearances. So we talk about things like not just what was the outcome, although that may matter, but how long did people wait to get their cases called? Who decided the order that the cases would be called in? How were different people treated in court? Uh, what was the clerk? How did the clerk interact with the attorneys versus how did the clerk interact with unrepresented people, et cetera? I'm gonna share two stories of how uh, these discussions, actually how one discussion played out and how one discussion I hope is going to play out later today. Uh, but so the first is a story from the very beginning of the semester, actually the very first time we went to court. Um, and we were spending a decent portion of that time just observing other people uh, waiting in court. So um, we were waiting in court and a, a young black gentleman came in and sat in the back of the courtroom. And as soon as he did, uh, the deputy came over and uh, told the gentleman to take his baseball cap off because it was disrespectful to be wearing a cap in court. The gentleman, the black gentleman who had just been told to take his cap off immediately pointed to the front of the room where there was a white defendant standing in front of the judge at the podium talking at length with the judge also wearing a white baseball, uh, a baseball cap. And he had not been told to take off his cap. So uh, the, the uh, black gentleman pointed it out, the deputy got embarrassed, but still insisted that the black man take his cap off. And then the deputy sort of stood awkwardly, unsure if he was supposed to do anything about the uh, white defendant who he had not been told to take his cap off. I thought this incident would uh, be this fascinating opportunity to, and actually quite clear opportunity to talk openly with the students and specifically about how race impacts our involvement with and experiences of justice in the criminal legal system. Um, and one of our students freely and very accurately recounted the incident at the beginning of class and laid out the factual detail. But then uh, when I asked the students to talk about what was going on in that moment, uh, what they thought had happened, there was a tremendous reluctance to even surface the idea of race being involved in this incident. Uh, what I found was that the students all wanted to focus on the motive of the deputy. And since there wasn't an obvious, uh, there was enough proof that the de uh, deputy had a racist motive, that they didn't want to talk about how race could have been involved. Um, so we finally got into a discussion about, uh, well, I said, finally said, let's set aside motive for a moment. Uh, I agree that perhaps we don't have explicit evidence of motive. So let's set that aside for a moment and ask how would the black gentleman have perceived this experience? Um, did it matter to him what the deputy's motives were? Can injustice happen in the context of something that has no obvious connection to the things that we usually talk about when we discuss justice. So we discuss justice in the context of the charging incident, who the police stop, who they charge, who the prosecutors move forward with, convictions and sentences. And we seem to limit justice to the idea of outcomes. I'm certainly not suggesting it doesn't apply there. It absolutely does. But can justice uh, be involved in an incident so to my students, perhaps seemingly minor as how you are who is told to take their baseball cap off in class. And um, perhaps most importantly, could this uh, gentleman who is told to take his cap off have perceived, is he likely to believe that he can obtain justice in this courtroom? Um, so that was a uh, it really fascinating discussion for me and an entry point into, um, into talking about things. I think that the idea of getting really granular with the discussion and with the facts of what happened and how that impacted people uh, allowed the students to overcome their reluctance to some extent, not fully, and engage in the idea of what does justice look like in the minutia of the courtroom. Um, the second incident that uh, happens that I think is a segue into this is, so our clinic has taken to, uh, we staff a, a petty offense calendar where the uh, folks that charged it with crimes on that calendar are not facing jail time. So they go pretty much entirely unrepresented. I, don't, I uh, actually don't think I've ever seen another attorney there and the public defenders don't staff that calendar. So uh, we offered to staff that calendar specifically because people were going out unrepresented. Uh, a couple interesting points there. One is that the um, I got in contact with the chief judge of that particular county and offered um, 
he sent an email or the public defender was really enthusiastic about it. Uh, she sent an email to the head prosecutor and um, the prosecutor in Minnesota nice fashion uh, sent an email without me included and said, um, I think this would be a waste of judicial resources. So he didn't know that I, the public defender then forwarded that email to me. The judge invited us anyway, and then I got to meet with the prosecutor. And he um, pretended to be kind of enthused, enthused about our clinic's presence. But what he said is, um, I want you to know that we already have a really good system here, and the cases never go to trial. And specifically what he said is, um, I'm fine with students appearing, but I, what I really wouldn't want is more trials. So that was the background behind us appearing on that calendar. Um, our clinic has appeared five times now on that calendar, and I have actually never seen anyone do anything other than plead guilty in the entire time we've been there, um, except for us. So last week we went to trial in that court, um, and it was an assault case. The um, defense was self-defense, and uh, the prosecutor, a number of interesting things happened. One was that the prosecutor was just rolling his eyes visibly through the whole trial. Um, the other was that he was objecting to the relevance. So we were trying to um, bring in instances of previous threats made by the alleged victim and uh, her friends against our client. Um, the prosecutor objected to the relevance repeatedly of anything outside the specific context of basically the minutes leading up to the uh, fight that was involved. And the judge sustained all of the relevance objections um, very vocally and in fact instructed our students um, multiple times that they were not permitted to discuss anything outside the context of uh, the specific incident that led to the charge. So uh, we are debriefing that today in class in a couple hours. And here are some of the questions I plan to ask because that trial uh, just happened a couple weeks ago. So a couple of the questions I plan to ask. How do the prosecutors and judges' conceptions of justice seem to differ from ours? Um, what factual evidence, again, with the idea of getting as granular as we can, what factually, uh, factual evidence can we come up with from those who participate in the trial or another of our students watched um, to, for this uh, belief that they have different conceptions of justice than us? Why does the prosecutor profess a concern about judicial resources? What is going on with that uh, statement that he expressed? Keeping in mind that we're a pro bono clinic that doesn't get any funding from the court. Why did the prosecutor specifically say he didn't, what he didn't wanna see is more trials? Why does the prosecutor and the judge have a different sense of relevance than us? Um, so these are uh, questions I wanna ask. And I can see that I got a, a question, how are, uh, how is the clinic structured such that students are in court together? I'll just answer that briefly. I have nine students in my clinic and they usually work in teams. So uh, most of the time there are two students on a case. Um, uh, we have one particularly large case that actually involves four students, but occasionally um, other students, even when it's two appearing on a case, other students occasionally come to court watch. Um, and I can follow up with that if there are more questions about that. But the reason I think these, conversations in class are important is that um, they tie back to this idea that I mentioned at the beginning is I want students to decide for themselves whether the system is just and what their role is. Is their role to assimilate or is their role to disrupt? If they don't critically analyze what they see in court, I think the temptation is just they'll accept it, they'll think it's normal, they'll think it's appropriate, and they'll meld right in. Um, and I'll close with just uh, two contrasting perspectives on justice that I think build on what Professor Walker Sterling talked about at the end of her session um, that I heard this past week. So one was from a judge we were appearing in front of on a sentence thing. Um, our students had, as per usual in a clinic, uh, extensive argument about the sentence. They had letters in support. They had a family member in support. They had a, um, an employer present a letter. And then at the end of their lengthy argument, the judge said, quote, I'm going to give you the same sentence that I give every single defendant who ever appears in my courtroom convicted of this crime. And then he imposed sentence. Um, I also got an email the day after that happened. I got an email from an alumnus of the clinic, actually the Denver clinic, who said, um, she was writing to me about something else, but she said, and this is another quote, 
I'm still utterly perplexed as to what justice actually is, but I'm starting to accept that it might just be different in every single case. And so I'll end by saying, in some ways, I wish that I had a clearer definition of justice and that my students could walk away from a semester in the clinic with a very precise definition. Um, but if I had to pick, I'd much rather have the student saying, justice might be different in every single case than the judge who says, um, I'm going to give you the same sentence that I give in every single defendant who's ever convicted of this crime. Because I think um, at its core, justice requires a recognition that people, the people involved in our system are individuals. They're not cogs in a machine, they're humans, and they have different needs. Um, and to the extent we as clinicians and our students as student attorneys can remind people of the humanity of our clients, and I think in some way we're getting closer to achieving justice. So with that, uh, I will turn it over to uh, the UNLV folks. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you so much. So um, before discussing our clinic, I, I just want to roadmap where we are so far. So um, Professor Sterling talked about uh, um, asking the students directly in a probing way throughout the semester, what does justice look like to you? What does it look like to your client and to the prosecutor? Where are the gaps? And um, I, I really appreciated thinking about students as justice creators and then thinking about how misdemeanor court is such a unique laboratory for creativity to create justice in. Um, and that justice is uh, not just the outcome, but it's a process. And um, Professor Sterling used the word um, phenomenological. You know, what does it feel like? What is it? And I heard this, um, Professor Moran, when you were talking about what, um, asking your students to think what the, uh, um, what the black man who was asked to take off his baseball cap, what his um, experience of justice or injustice would be, the femin um, phenomenological way of looking at that, you know, what the actual experience of it is, and asking students to do the same. So um, Professor Traum and I are, are going to shift a bit to thinking about once we've established with the students some sense of the injustice that's happening and what justice might look like, what are the impediments that remain for students in moving forward? Um, and we really identified uncertainty as a major cause of um, their inertia and resistance in the bad way, <laughs> like resistance to actually moving forward to try to <laughs> solve problems. <laughs> so a word about our clinic, um, it is new. Um, it is, has so far operated in the um, Las Vegas Justice Court, which is the court of first appearance and where misdemeanors that occur in Clark County um, uh, are heard and, um, and resolved. And the way we went about it was we found a, um, we partnered with a judge who we identified as open to our presence and not adverse to work and interested in justice happening in her courtroom. So she is willing to, uh, and has been willing to refer cases to us for um, defendants uh, who are not facing jail time, they don't qualify for the public defender, but who, uh, have expressed either to the court their concern and their desire for an attorney, or the, the case in, in her mind is troubling and, and so she referred it to us. We did get cases from some other sources, but, but there was a design choice for our first semester to start it with a judge who would um, welcome us there. There's certainly other courtrooms that we can expand to where we would, um, uh, where our style of um, arguing for on behalf of clients, <laughs> <laughs> paper motions um, and you know uh, presenting evidence calling witnesses would be uh, less welcome and seen as gumming up the the wheels of the machine and there's there's um, a lot of merit to that as well but this is where we started out so when thinking about uncertainty uh, we are going to present it as um, a case study this case was procedurally unusual because it was post conviction someone coming in um, arguing that he had not um, understood what a lawyer had done on his behalf, which Professor Traum will talk about. Um, but our, our theme through it is this struggle that the students have, um, two struggles in particular. One is um, the difference between fitting in and fighting. They want so much to be respected professionals in that court. They see that they need to be perceived in a certain way. 
um, for hiring purposes as well, um, and they want to um, they want to fit in. But often, fighting the injustice that's occurring looks different than that. And then the other piece of that is the legal part of it that they um, they which relates to it, but they tend to look at the law and see no way forward or see justice in very crabbed or narrow terms and options in crabbed and narrow terms. Um, and so, so part of our work was trying to push them past that. So I'll turn it over to Professor Trom to tell the story. Thank you, Thank Professor you. And Before I begin, I just wanted to say how delighted I am to be here. Obviously, I'm very happy to be teaching with Professor Hanan, but also because I'm not new to the law and not new to clinical teaching, but new to this particular clinic. Um, it's really been wonderful to hear the wisdom from my colleagues and also to reflect more deeply on the experience that we had last semester with Professor Hanan. So that's been really fun for us. I want to set up this story as just a series of snapshots and then kind of um, ex we were just going to reflect on the different, what was happening, what we observed in the students at various points along the road. So let me just set it up um, with the, as Professor Hanan um, referred, and we kind of have these different snapshots. One is starting with the injustice, then the legal lockbox that the students found themselves stuck in, um, then kind of the breakthrough of uh, re rewriting the ending of the story because this was a post-conviction case. Um, we needed a new ending. Uh, and then finally, sort of taking a public risk and kind of putting the students, putting themselves on the line to, to see what, if they could make, um, make a better ending for the client. Um, so the client was a really interesting person. He was a professional dancer, which in Las Vegas was uh, just a fun experience to, to get to know him. He appeared in court for this outstanding warrant. He apparently had talked himself uh, when he d avoided arrest and was able to come in on his own. And he said to the court that he really didn't know what this was for. And the court explained to him that this was from seven years ago, from 2012, um, and that he had been charged with reckless driving and he had failed to um, pay a fine and, and maybe do one other requirement. And so as a result of, if he had done those things, it would have been reduced to a speeding ticket, but he didn't. So now he has this rec reckless driving conviction and she wasn't sure what to do. And he reacted to this like, I don't know what you're talking about. Um, he really didn't even remember the incident. But then as he was just sort of talking in court said he just he didn't know like what had happened. Um, so that's when we got appointed. Um, and we, uh, you know, we got a court return date and we brought the client in for an interview. Before the interview, the students actually made this amazing um, uh, with some sleuthing on their own, made this event, this discovery that was just pure gold. And what they discovered was that the client had um, called sort of what, what's like a DUI attorney, one of the ones around town that advertises on billboards. And they looked up this attorney and they discovered that in the exact same time, like seven years ago, within a month or so of um, when this ticket had been issued, um, this attorney had been disciplined by the State Bar of Nevada for doing the exact same thing that happened to our client, which is that he, people called him, he went to court without the client, he agreed to something, failed to tell the client what to do, and then the client suffers the bad consequences of that, right? Um, either a worse conviction or um, sort of, you know, being brought into court again and saying, I, I didn't even know that this happened. I was never told that I was supposed to do X or Y. So, this was like pure gold. Everyone was sort of amazed, like, oh my gosh, this is great. You've discovered what has happened. It's like a very concrete and clear injustice. Um, and the students at that moment are feeling like pretty high on themselves and we're all excited. Like, what can we do with this? Um, and so uh, we're, you know, the client is very agreeable. He's like, anything you can do would be great. And um, they're trying to figure out like what, uh, what they're going to do next, but they're very excited about this. So that was sort of the initial breakthrough was extremely positive and empowering, I would say. Um, so uh, Professor Hanan, maybe you can just take it from there. Yes, thank you. So, so they, they were, um, so this is a clear injustice that they agreed on. They saw what they had there. And when they moved into um, thinking about how to how to address this in the courtroom setting, they quickly found themselves in what we call the legal lockbox. They, um, there's, there's just no way forward um, uh, procedurally. It didn't fit under the habeas 
framework or uh, under a motion to correct an illegal sentence. It just didn't have a, it didn't have a procedural vehicle. And so from their training in law school thus far, they just became completely stuck. They said there's just no way forward. And our assessment of that is that part of that problem is um, the reputational concern that need to fit in. They're very concerned about doing things the way they're supposed to be done um, and demonstrating that they understand the law well and that they are not um, naive or ignorant of it or misunderstanding of it. So they had a lot of resistance to trying to find a way forward when it wasn't clear what the procedural vehicle would be. And it isn't something that they see happen in court, even in an informal way. Um, and a, a, a footnote on that is that as often happens when we push students and they feel stuck, they turn on someone, sometimes us, in this case, they, they turned on each other. And so we did have to negotiate some uh, conflicts that they had um, between each other about this. Um, until they, we, we really move, tried to move them, reorient them towards, you know, keeping hold of the injustice and thinking about what should happen and who could make it happen. And so the aha moment came when, uh, when one of the students identified it was, we, we need to, the, the end of the story has to be rewritten and we need to get the judge or get someone to rewrite the end of the story and write it a different way. And so they, uh, they realized that pitching the story thus far is really the way to go with it. So um, the first step was reaching out to the prosecutor in this case. And um, Professor Tom, do you want to talk a little bit about the that part of it, or would you like me to go ahead with that? Um, that's fine. I'm happy to. So, um, so they what they did. The reason they had to reach out to the prosecutor is that we were trying this time when we were in this legal lockbox. They were actually trying to figure out what to file because we had a return date, right? So. At some point, they went, they reached out to the prosecutor to kind of spell out the story. And lo and behold, the prosecutor was responsive. So in a moment, all of their fears about how they were going to negotiate or figure out how to get out of the post-conviction situation kind of melted away. And we were back to where we usually are, which is trying to figure out what the deal is going to be with the prosecutor. So at least that kind of um, opened that pathway um, and then they were negotiating with the prosecutor and the prosecutor um, was kind of willing to give them the benefit of the bargain that the, that the client got from this original bad attorney, right? Which is standard offer, but not willing to do more. And so they had to kind of confront that, um, that decision point of whether to just make this case go away on the terms that the prosecutor was giving them, which is typical, um, or kind of push a little push back a little bit and see if they could do something more. So this is all playing out like in the sort of not even 24 hours, like, like in the 10 hours leading up to court um, with sort of late night emails and then we'll see you in court and right before the calendar starts. So they're moving forward and um, they uh, are consulting with the client who's there obviously and, and they just, the client wants something, we all kind of want something a little better. So they have to turn down the offer from the prosecutor and say to the prosecutor, we'd like to argue this to the judge so when the court calls the case, we all go up and the prosecutor indicates that they want to actually, the prosecutor wants to approach the bench to tell the judge what the background of the story is. In some ways that's great because the story coming out of a prosecutor sometimes just has more force. We go to the bench and the, and the prosecutor explains what's happened with this prior attorney and the judge says, I think the public needs to hear this. Um, which is they need to know that this is what happened to people who hire attorneys who don't do their jobs. So um, that was sort of a green light, which is we're kind of back to that original injustice that everyone feels has actually happened, right? Like something really went wrong here and even the judge is weighing in to say that that's true. So we go, um, so we, we uh, explain to the judge we're going to submit um, the issue to the judge. And we go back to our positions in the courtroom to make the argument and the students spell it out. Um, and the entire courtroom, which uh, Professor Hanan was walking, watching so she could, she could maybe describe that, um, watches as the students kind of tell, share this injustice publicly. Do you wanna? Yes, thank you. So yes, I, I was uh, in the audience and people were wrapped, paying attention to what was happening and what was being said partly because the case was taking longer than 30 seconds, real arguments were being made, and, um, and they were, and 
it was clear that the judge was interested in the fact that a lawyer had not done his job and had harmed a client and that something unfair had happened. So, so there was in this instance, you know, real payoff for the students in the sense that the students took a big risk, even with our support going in and doing things differently than how things happen in court. Um, and I'll say as a footnote to that, one of the two students had quite a bit of experience in a public defender externship he had done in the past and knew some of the public defenders in the court as well and wanted, you know, wanted to fit in and do things the way that things are normally done, um, which uh, involves advocacy. It's, it's, a, it's a good public defender's office, but this was above and beyond what normally happens in that context. So um, in spite of those reputational concerns, there was this moment where they were actually able to change the course of what happened in court. Um, and I'm mindful of the time because I know we started late. So <laughs> I'm, just, I'm going to, um, the outcome for the, cl the client was good. There's, there's, there's more to talk about about how the judge handled it from there. But, um, but, but uh, the situation was modified in a way which was much fairer for the client. Um, but some of the takeaways from it for the students that I think we can now begin being more explicit about are is that doing justice doesn't feel the way you may think it's going to feel. It doesn't feel brave and heroic. One doesn't feel confident. You're oftentimes mired in uncertainty and concerns about appealing or appearing foolish. And, um, and because you're trying to do things differently than how things normally happen in court, it is often going to be the case that you just don't know how to move forward and you're taking steps, only being able to see at most one step forward um, and being and just keeping as your guiding light what you think the outcome should be, what you think a fair result is. Um, and to support students in that who are still really trying to understand uh, what their professional role is, um, is a challenge. And, um, but it's one which I think, unless we're just going to replicate an already unjust system, the only way to do it is to help students work through those challenges. Professor Trump, maybe you'd like to add some more on the takeaways with that as well. Right. I just wanted, I want to just echo this point that uncertainty may feel really crappy when it's happening and it might actually feel kind of like going to an, you know, it's sort of this anxiety that our students were navigating was like going to an exam and not being prepared for the exam, which is sort of our like recurring professional and student nightmare. Um, and I, and the way I think to, um, on reflection, to unpack that, right, is that there's this contrast between fitting in and fighting and fitting and that what they want to do is fit in and and appear professional and knowing what they're doing and where we need to guide them is exactly that emotional state which is knowing what they're doing and a different and knowing what they're doing is getting justice and having a path right which is an uncertain path but i think that that providing that support and homework is done and you've at least tried to figure this out and really make a go of it um, and imagine what that's going to look like and feel supported from your colleagues, right? That that sort of providing that support is something that we can really get a place where we can get them to um, that mimics the sort of emotional certainty of fitting in, right? So part of that is to kind of do exactly what our students do, which is kind of rewrite the script and possibly change the ending, but kind of at least get the sense that you know what you're doing because um, that's or at least have a, a real plan of what you're going to do um, and feel supported in that because that's the only way maybe to push our students into that space um, and get them to be supported. We've also had things that didn't turn out quite as well and uh, like Ra Rachel, Ra Professor Moran was talking about, sometimes you're out there knowing that you're going to get slammed, right? And, <laughs> and we're setting our students up for that. Um, and so we need to be very cognizant of sort of um, it, anticipating that happening. Um, so I don't know if you wanted to say anything more, Professor Hanan. Yes, there was a, a, a another case like that, and I'm sure we could all tell stories of this as well, but where we had to really work with the student to make um, a, a powerful argument about what was fair in terms of fines and fees. And he presented um, hospital documentation about the um, client's injuries, why the client couldn't work or do community service. It was 
compelling and well done, but it was hard for him to do because all of our intelligence from other courtroom professionals was that this judge would never vary from the sentence he always gives. And in fact, he didn't. But, um, but then working with students afterwards to identify the value in doing it anyway is important. A question did come in um, about favorite readings on justice in the misdemeanor defense. And I'm just thinking about it a little bit how the readings I think about all identify the problems in misdemeanor defense. And a recent book that's wonderful on that is Crook County, about Cook County, and it's written by um, an anthropologist who uh, got thousand plus hours of ethnographic observation in it. Um, it's a wonderful book. Um, uh, Gonzalez Van Cleve is her last name. Yeah, uh, Nicole. Nicole yes. Gonzalez Van Cleve. Nicole, yes. And it's excellent, but um, but there, there need to be more writings about victories and valor in the misdemeanor court. Most of the readings, my go-to readings in that area and uh, thinking about how to bring justice tend to have to do with more serious cases or Brian Stevenson, that sort of writing. So I, I leave it to others here. If others on our, our panel here have ideas about good readings on how justice happens in misdemeanor defense. Well, there, there is a new book um, out by uh, Professor Natapoff, Alexander Natapoff, called Punishment Without Crime. That's specifically about misdemeanor courts. And uh, Professor Natapoff has been writing in the area of, of, of due process and fairness in misdemeanor courts for a long time. Um, and so uh, this book, it, I really feel like it just came out in the last few months. Um, and again, it's called Punishment Without Crime. Uh, by Professor Alexandra Natapoff. Um, I just picked it up. Uh, no, I'm a fan of her other stuff, and so I'm I'm sure that this will also be great. But <clears throat> I haven't made my way through it yet. But her other writings on misdemeanor court are all are also really excellent. So that's one thing I can recommend. I also um, have my students uh, this semester. I had them listen to the third uh, season of Serial. Um, which uh, they found, which they enjoyed for all sorts of reasons, um, including that it's a podcast. So I think it was just sort of easier for them to fit into very busy schedules. Um, but uh, that uh, was able to uh, uh, spur a lot of really great discussion about misdemeanor courts and um, whether or not it really is sort of like, uh, whether or not it really is low stakes and um, a lot of uh, great uh, conversations there. Um, and then also uh, season two of In the Dark, another podcast, um, um, which is a, it's a case in, from Mississippi about a man named Curtis Flowers who's been tried six times for the same uh, quadruple murder. Um, and the case actually was just heard in the, uh, the Supremes just heard it um, uh, on a, based on a challenge to um, fairness and jury selection. Um, so, um, and then, you know, there, and then I also, uh, assigned sort of like the regular, uh, you know, law review articles that everybody assigns. So there's, um, wait, uh, let me just scoot the screen over so I can see my syllabus. Um, there, there are a couple of pieces by, uh, Barbara Bab Babcock. One is called The Duty to Defend. The other is called Defending the Guilty. Um, uh. I just uh, thought of one too. Uh, it, it's, um. Jenny Roberts has yep. a couple articles which are, are great, a few actually at this point. Yes. Um, there's, she also uh, explores in one of them parsimony in misdemeanor sentencing, which mm -hmm. is another way to get at um, thinking about justice for clients in, a, in the sense of resolving their cases. And of course she writes about crashing the misdemeanor system by, by actually uh, lawyering the cases. And I'll add one. Um, it's a book called Ordinary Injustice by Amy Bach. But uh, I actually just assigned the introduction to the book to my students. We, I couldn't, you know, didn't have space to have them read the whole book. But what I love about it is that she's talking about how ordinary injustice looks. And she's also specifically talking, at least some of the time, about the misdemeanor courtroom and how you might not immediately notice what injustice is which was a great segue into the discussions we have in our class. Uh, 
Okay, great. Well, uh, I, if there are more questions, we have more time. I realize it's 10 o'clock. We did start late, but uh, we want to make sure that there's an opportunity for questions if there are questions. Layla's telling me there's no more questions thus far, but we'll we'll wait here for a few minutes and just just see what we get. Yeah. Well, while we have a moment or two, I will then share this last story I wanted to share, which was short about the student who uh, went into court and um, and made the argument for reduced fines for his um, for his client. In that particular day in that courtroom, it was a different courtroom that we didn't go to that often with a judge who never reduces. And we had, um, there, were, there were probably 75 people in the audience. And when the judge said at the end, you know, that's a very compelling story, but the fine for this is always the same amount. I always do this because if I make an exception for your client, I would have to consider exceptions in every case. And looked out to this audience of people. I looked back at the audience of people and thought, how just that would be if in every case <laughs> the judge considered what ought to happen. And uh, the student afterwards in debriefing it, you know, did feel very good about having made the case for the client. And the client, of course, as we so often see, you know, was, was incredibly grateful for, um, for the assistance. Um, having said that, I think another move that we may consider making in the future is to, is to think about bringing constitutional challenges to these excessive fines, citing to the Tim's case from the last, the court's last, uh, mm -hmm. a few months ago. So there might be a different way to move forward on them as well. I think, um, it's just really empowering, I think, for people in the courtroom in two different ways. And I, I think that the students can, when they see that and feel that, it's, it just makes them feel differently, which is when you watch, I mean, as, as Professor Maram was talking about, you can, you can watch case after case, 30 seconds a piece. Um, and this, there seems like there's no way of stopping that train. And so one of the ways is to bring legal arguments. Another way is to bring in some element of the outside world from fact development and investigation. And I think that that was as much surprising, just that someone is willing to make the argument, but also that someone brought something of real life into this space, um, because it really seems like through time, it's just like all reality is kind of squeezed out and this is the only reality that exists. And I, I think that it really gets the students and to think about it and also gets everyone else in the courtroom to think about it, right? Which is how did I get here and why is this happening? Um, it, there's almost no space for that in the sort of just press to move through the cases so quickly. Uh, we do have a question. Um, how do you balance teaching substantive law with teaching justice and assigning these more systemic and theoretical readings? How do you emphasize the importance of learning these things as competency versus the trial skills or criminal code and evidence code? So for, uh, for our part, we did not assign a lot of theoretical readings. We took um, short segments out of some uh, works, uh, out of uh, articles and books, but we did keep it short. Um, and I would say front loading uh, trial, uh, trial skills, negotiation skills, we really front loaded the skills necessary for lawyering um, and then added in more of the theory as the students were becoming more aware of what was happening in the courtroom. But we did go light on the readings. I tend to use the readings to kind of structure my thoughts around it, but, but I don't assign them as often or much of them. I, but I'm interested in hearing what others do. Yeah, I can um, say I struggled so much. I love this question because as I was also designing a syllabus for the first time, I struggled so much with this balance. Um, what I ended up doing, and I'm not perfectly satisfied with it, I'm going to keep thinking about this over the summer, but I did a lot of, so I had a three day, three full days of orientation before the semester started, um, and we talked, I assigned some of my more theoretical readings there, with the idea being what I'd love to start with is um, discussions about why they're doing this work and who they want to be as lawyers and how 
they can be attuned to the issues around them and then build the skills in a little bit later. Um, it was difficult because they were appearing in court uh, the Monday after orientation. <laughs> and so it wasn't as if, you know, I'm obviously also trying to get them to learn like, how do you have a meeting with the client? And what's the first thing you do in your first court appearance? Um, but uh, so I think it surprises the students a little bit perhaps, but um, to me, it's so, it's such a necessary foundation to have the ideas behind what they're doing. And I wanna build that, um, it's an unexpected, but a, a place where students kind of get excited to talk about. And then, um, and then I just felt like I'm constantly like, in hectic mode, trying to get them to learn the necessary skills. So that's the difficult trade-off. Um, I also uh, front load a lot of the skill stuff. We have a pretty intensive orientation that we do um, where we where the students work through an entire simulated case before they pick up uh, actual clients. Um, and that has a lot of focus on um, acquiring skills, um, at a time when the students are super concerned about acquiring skills because they're really nervous before they pick up the clients. Um, though we do uh, introduce um, ideas, um, the, the systemic and theoretical ideas and frameworks in that orientation. Um, and, uh, and then we just sort of have them unspool um, uh, in classes um, throughout the rest of the semester at uh, sort of a more leisurely pace. So I, I think that might be the end of our questions. Uh, I really want to thank our presenters, um, Professor Hanan, Trom, uh, Professor Walking Sterling, uh, and Professor Moran. Uh, this has just been a really wonderful session. I've really enjoyed it. Um, if any of you wanted to add any closing remarks, you certainly may jump in. Uh, but otherwise, we, we really look forward to continuing this conversation. Uh, our next session is going to be about teaching racial justice, uh, and we look forward to future sessions in the coming year. Thanks to everyone for participating with the webinar. Thank you, and I think I, we would all welcome contact offline as well, um, if you'd like to reach us at our institutions as well um, with any questions. I'm excited about misdemeanor clinics becoming um, uh, more common and and having the pedagogy develop over time as well. So thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.